In the last part of this lesson, you learned about how the pollen tube grows towards the ovule. But now remember, the pollen tube has two sperm inside. What happens with the two sperm? Well, it's something called double fertilization. One sperm fertilizes the egg. The second sperm fertilizes the two polar nuclei that make up the central cell. The sperm that fuses with the egg will develop into, will become the diploid zygote, which then develops through mitosis into the diploid embryo. The second sperm, which fuses with the two polar nuclei, will become a tissue which is called the endosperm. Now, how many sets of chromosomes does the endosperm have? Take a look, there's three nuclei fusing together. That means the endosperm is triploid. It has three sets of chromosomes. What is the purpose of the endosperm? The endosperm stores nutrients, which it provides for the growing embryo. And here you can see a seed where all of these parts are visible. So inside is the embryo. This white stuff is the endosperm. And the outside of the seed, the seed coat, here's the seed coat, is what actually used to be the outside of the ovule. So the outside of the ovule becomes the seed coat, the fertilized egg becomes the embryo, and the fertilized polar nuclei become the endosperm. Now let's take a brief look at what happens during embryo development. So when the sperm fertilizes the egg, it, they become the zygote. And the zygote divides by mitosis to form the embryo. The first mitotic division is unequal. It forms a smaller cell and a bigger cell. That smaller cell continues to divide to form the embryo proper. The bigger cell divides to form this long strand of cells that connects the embryo to the seed. You could almost think of it as being similar to the human umbilical cord. That embryo uh, has initially has a ball shape and then becomes this really cute heart shape. And the two lobes of the heart develop into the first seedling leaves called the cotyledons. So they're the first leaves that form in the embryo. Underneath the cotyledons is a short stem called the hypocotyl, and then a root, which in embryos is sometimes referred to as the radical. So the plant embryo is very simple, just cotyledons, short stem, and a root. Some embryos have two cotyledons and they're called eudicots. Others have one cotyledon and they're referred to as monocots. And here you can see a eudicot seed with its two cotyledons surrounded by the endosperm. And here's a monocot seed with one cotyledon and also surrounded by the endosperm. Now, do you remember the role of the endosperm? It provides nutrients for the growing embryo. And in some seeds, the cotyledons absorb the endosperm and the cotyledons themselves become the nutrient source. Here's an avocado seed where that happens. Here's the little hypocotyl and the radical and then these two big lobes, they're the cotyledons and they provide um, the nutrients for the developing seedling when it germinates up until the point when it can do photosynthesis and make more energy and nutrients. Now, the reason I'm spending time talking about the cotyledons and endosperm is because um, the growth of an organism requires free energy and matter. To really understand how an organism functions, you need to know where its energy and where its nutrients come from. So the ovules develop into the seeds and inside each seed is a developing embryo. Remember, the ovules are inside an ovary, and then the ovary develops into the fruit. So each ovary has one or more ovules, and then it becomes the fruit, which has one or more seeds inside. 
and you can see it here with the cherries. So each cherry flower has the carpal with its ovary. Inside the ovary is a single ovule. That ovule becomes the seed and the rest of the ovary becomes the cherry fruit that surrounds the seed. It's a little tricky to see with these, but you can more clearly see it in this picture. I know this doesn't much look like a fruit, but for now, trust me. So here's the flower and here's the over, here are the ovaries inside. And this becomes the fruit. And then the fruit eventually dries out and you can see the seeds exposed inside. There's all kinds of shapes and sizes of fruits. I know you're just used to th thinking of like peaches and apples and cherries as fruits, but anything that develops from an ovary is a fruit. That includes pea pods, zucchini, string beans, eggplant, all of those are fruits. Their job is to protect the enclosed seeds and to aid in their dispersal. So um, fruits like these these dandelion fruits disperse the seeds by wind. Others, like raspberries, they're dispersed by animals. Um, it takes a lot of energy for the plant to produce um, this nice sugary flesh like a raspberry or an apple. So why does the plant spend energy making the fruit? Well, your evolutionary fitness is measured by your reproductive success. That all of that sugar that the plant needs to make to say build an apple is worth it because it attracts an animal to eat the fruit. Then the animal walks away and it poops out the seeds. So the seeds get dispersed. So the mother plant is basically sending her babies out into the world. And the reason she wants to do it is if the seeds fell in the same place where the mother plant is and they started growing there, then the mom would be competing with her children for all of the resources in that environment. So it's evolutionarily beneficial for the plant to produce a structure that helps to disperse the seeds elsewhere so that its children are not directly competing with the mother plant. So as the fruits and the seeds are maturing, the seeds initially dry out and enter a period of dormancy. You can see it here in these string beans. Initially, the beans are green and juicy, and then they dry out and here are the dry beans. So think about why is it evolutionarily beneficial for the seed to initially be dry and dormant? Well, remember, the growth and the function of an organism requires energy and matter. What if the seeds germinated immediately right before winter is about to start? Would they be able to grow successfully in the winter? Not likely. So they enter a dormant period until the environmental conditions are favorable for the seed to germinate so that the plant can grow successfully. So there are a number of cues for seeds to germinate. One being water. When water is available, the plant growth is going to be successful. So that's the first cue. For some seeds, they need to be exposed to cold. They actually need to go through winter before they germinate. And you can trick them by just putting them in the fridge for a while if you want them to germinate earlier. Some seeds need light in order to germinate. If you ever try to grow lettuce, remember, don't bury it in the soil, just sprinkle it on the soil because lettuce seeds need light as one of their cues. And this is the last one, the weirdest one. Some seeds only germinate after they've passed through an animal's digestive tract. The enzymes in the animal's stomach and intestines weaken the seed coat so that the seed can germinate. And this is beneficial because once they've passed through the animal's digestive tract, it ensures that the seed has been dispersed away from the mom. So now let's look at what happens during seed germination. First thing is the softening of the seed coat. The seed takes in water, and once the water is taken in, that activates enzymes that will begin to digest the starch that's stored in either the endosperm and the cotyledons. The starch is digested so that the plant has glucose available to do cellular respiration so that it can divide and grow. 
then the root emerges as the first. After the root emerges, then come the cotyledons, and eventually you get a growth of a new stem and growth of new leaves from the meristem tissue.